Good morning, Pursuit Church. Let us stand and worship our Lord. A call to worship comes from Isaiah 9-2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in an end of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for sending the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to this world, Father, to be a light in, in this dark world. Father, we glorify you and we thank you, Lord, in this season, Father. Uh, we pray that you may be glorified in this worship and we dedicate this, these songs to you today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
seated. Well, welcome to uh, Pursuit Church. So happy that you're here to worship the Lord uh, with us this morning. It, I always say it's the best day of the week. It is certainly for me just to be here and uh, to turn our attention solely on God and His Word and how good He is. And so uh, just hope you're, hope you're ready to do that this morning. Well, um, in the life of our church, we do have four different Bible study groups that go on uh, each week. Uh, they go on both in, on Zoom and also in person uh, for different groups. Um, my group will be happening this week, again, Tuesday evening. And uh, David's group, I guess, is happening, um, I think. Uh, you can contact him. And also, uh, I think Tony and Marcella's group on Thursday night will not be happening as they are... They are in Buffalo, and uh, I don't know if the slide is showing or not. Robert is alone this morning in the 
the, uh, the booth, so uh, just pray for him. And Oh, there it is. Um, but if you're interested in one of those groups, you could just write down the, the email address there, write to the leader, and uh, they'll write back to you, give you a Zoom link or whatever else that you need to uh, participate in that. Well, um, there's a couple things that I need to bring your, to your attention uh, this morning, a couple of sad things, actually. Um, now, many of you may not have known Libya Hazim. Um, she's the mother-in-law of Vanessa uh, Garcia. And the last time that we saw her, or that I saw her, um, was you know last March um, when they used to come. And, uh, but she passed away this week. And uh, so we're praying for, for Vanessa and the family of uh, Curtis um, and just just that whole family. And so th I did have a chance to, uh, the honor of helping with a memorial service on Wednesday afternoon uh, just to remember Libya and the family was there and they had a good time just sharing about her and their love for her. So I uh, wanted to bring that to your attention. Also, uh, tragically this week, uh, the son of uh, some close friends of Vic and Miley and Brian uh, he passed away this week in a tragic motorcycle accident. He was just 21 years old. The motorcycle accident, I believe, happened just about a mile north of here on Alafaya Trail. And the family, uh, their name is the Seltzers and have been very close uh, friends with Vic and Miley for years. And uh, it's one of the most difficult things that I can imagine to lose a child. And so my heart goes out for them. And I know Vic and Miley are heavy and grieving as well uh, for the Seltzer family. And so we'd like to, to pray for them uh, this morning. So please join me in prayer. Father, we, we do thank you for the goodness of, of Jesus and, and his heart that, uh, that wept, Lord, when, when Lazarus died, even though he raised him from the dead. Father, we, uh, we thank you for your, your compassion and your, um, just your heart for us as your, as your people. Lord, you desire everyone to, to know you and to be able to, to be with you forever. And so, Lord, help us take that message with us wherever we go. And, Lord, we do pray for uh, these families. Um, pray for Libya's family this morning that you would be with each of them, the, the brothers and the, the sisters and the aunts and uncles and um, sons and the sons and the grandchildren, Lord, that you would, you would be with each one of them in a special way, uh, to be close to their heart as they, as they remember Libya. And Lord, we especially pray for the Seltzers today and just the the tragedy that they've suffered, Lord, just the overwhelming grief that they must be going through. And uh, so I pray, Lord, also for Vic and Miley and Brian, that you would be their strength to, to help them support the Seltzer family in this, in this uh, tragic time. And uh, so, Father, we, we uh, just thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace that you shower upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I'd like to invite the deacons to come and receive the tithes and offerings. Feet may fail. 
Jesus, you're the king upon the throne. Thank you for the way you always loved me. Now I get to love you in return. Now I get to love you. may be seated, except for the children. They can be dismissed to their class. Whenever we read the Bible, it is easy to bring our own modern ideas into the ancient past. Um, that was the setting of the Bible. But we have to be careful, or at least aware, uh, that we are doing so. Sometimes um, it happens in movies or plays, um, like some of Shakespeare's, and this is called an anachronism. And uh, here are some examples in the slideshow. Okay, i got to read that, so get my glasses on. In a chronological misplacement of persons, objects, or events, and ideas in a piece of art or literature is an anachronism. Let's look at a few. Oh, there's one. I don't know if that's Beethoven or Bach. Civil War picture, Star Wars crawler. Looks almost normal. <laughs> that definitely modernizes that, uh, that picture. So, but those are some examples of anachronisms. And uh, when we look at our passage today in Nehemiah chapter 7, we will see that there are some things that we do not understand. Uh, there are some oddities, as I call them, uh, things that sound strange, to our ears or poke us in the eye even. Um, one of the, the uh, features of this chapter is a genealogy, okay? And uh, we are going to listen to it in its entirety. Um, this is a chapter of the Bible that if we were reading, we would most likely just kind of skim, skim past this. Uh, when a preacher preaches, there are usually several objectives. So the first is that people better understand their Bible, that is certainly a goal of mine, that you understand what's actually happening in the Bible so that you can make correct inferences and base your knowledge on a firmer and firmer foundation as you study and read the Bible. We have to understand the Bible is the Word of God, and as we've discussed, it's not easy to do so when the time and places and objectives are so different from our own. We have to come to some understanding of what's actually being said, and this is a job in itself, as language usage, the translation, and other issues can obscure the main points. Um, then we need to understand the why of things that are being said in their, in their context. Why is the author saying that? But even more deeply than that, why are the things even said at all? Sometimes there's a deeper level that we need to think about. Um, what are the objectives of what is being written? So another objective as a preacher is to make sure that we understand God's redemptive plan. Um, in each time period, God's goals were the same, to restore people to a relationship with him. Um, there are many things that humanity needs to understand in order to relate to God properly, um, as he should be related to. And he has revealed the important dimensions of that in each time period, and also the essential things in every time period that we need to know about. Um, but each time period gets, gets to know more than the previous. Um, today we understand that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of everything that was talked about in the Old Testament times. They all pointed toward Jesus Christ in some way, and we can see that with our 2020 hindsight now. Um, so Jesus is the author 
He's the inventor and the perfecter of our faith. So in addition to explaining the text and center it on Christ, we need to have some idea of how it applies to our lives. Sometimes that means that behavior should change. Other times it just means that our mind needs to change or we need to have a different attitude. And sometimes it's, it's merely we just need to have understanding of what the passage is so that we can build our, our thoughts and actions upon that. So we, need to, uh, we also need to have exhortation. We need to have exhortation to live fully for Christ in all the situations of our life. So this morning our chapter is Nehemiah chapter 7, and it's uh, with the help of Max McLean um, and Bible Gateway. We are going to hear this passage, uh, well pronounced. Uh, there's a lot of names in it, at 125% of the normal speed. And that's just to make it a little shorter for us. It will still take about five minutes. Now, as you listen to this, make some mental notes. Listen for things that sound odd to you, being 2,500 years uh, in the past. So, Robert, if you could bring that up and play the Max McLean reading of chapter 7. Nehemiah 7. Now when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hanani the governor of the castle charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, and while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts, and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large. But the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at the first, and I found written in it. These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramaiah, Nahamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispereth, Bigvi, Nehem, Bana, the number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parosh, 2,172, the sons of Shephatiah, 372, the sons of Ara, 652, the sons of Pahath, Moab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818, the sons of Elam, 1,254, the sons of Zatu, 845, the sons of Zakai, 760, the sons of Benui, 648, the sons of Babai, 628, the sons of Asgad, 2322, the sons of Adonikam, 667, the sons of Bigvi, 2067, the sons of Adin, 655, the sons of Ater, namely of Hezekiah, 98, the sons of Hashem, 328, the sons of Bezai, 324, the sons of Harif, 112, the sons of Gibeon, 95, the men of Bethlehem and Netophah, 188, the men of Amathoth, 128, the men of Beth, Asmaveth, 42, the men of Kiriath, Jerim, Shafira, and Beeroth, 743, the men of Ramah and Geba, 621, the men of Mikmas, 122, the men of Bethel and Ai, 123, the men of the other Nebo, 52, the sons of the other Elam, 1254, the sons of Harim, 320, the sons of Jericho, 345, the sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 721, the sons of Sena, 3930, the priests, the sons of Jediah, namely the house of Jeshua, 973, the sons of Emer, 1052, the sons of Peshur, 1247, the sons of Arim, 1017, the Levites, the sons of Jeshua, namely of Cadmiel, of the sons of Hodavah, 74, the singers, the sons of Asaph, 148, the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ater, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hatata, the sons of Shobai, 138, the temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Asapha, the sons of Taboth, the sons of Keros, the sons of Sia, the sons of Padan, the sons of Labana, the sons of Agaba, the sons of Shalmai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Bidel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Reiah, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazam, the sons of Uzzah, the sons of Baseah, the sons of Basai, the sons of Munim, the sons of Nefushaim, the sons of Bakbuk, the sons of Hakapa, the sons of Hahur, the sons of Bazlith, the sons of Mahida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tema, the sons of Neziah, the sons of Atipha, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Sephereth, the sons of Perida, the sons of Jala, the sons of Darkon, 
the sons of Gedel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pekareth Hazabaim, the sons of Ammon. All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. The following were those who came up from Tel Melah, Tel Hasha, Sharab, Adan, and Emer. But they could not prove their father's houses nor their descent, whether they belonged to Israel. The sons of Delaiah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. Also of the priests, the sons of Hobaiah, the sons of Akaz, the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but it was not found there, so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until a priest with Urim and Thummim should arise. The whole assembly together was 42,360 besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 245 singers, male and female. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. Now some of the heads of fathers' houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold, 50 basins, 30 priests' garments, and 500 miners of silver. And some of the heads of fathers' houses gave into the treasury of the work 20,000 derricks of gold and 2,200 miners of silver. And what the rest of the people gave was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 miners of silver, and 67 priests' garments. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants in all Israel, lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. Nehemiah 8. Well, did you catch all that? <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> a lot of names. But the interesting thing is, is that uh, God knows all of our names, too. Um, though it's, a, it's a long list of names for us to read, but it's uh, very, very tiny for what the Lord knows. He knows all of us. He will remember all of our deeds as well, um, as, he, as he did theirs. Well, um, so let's begin to look at our passage that we've just heard. Um, did you hear anything that sounded strange besides the 125% speed? Um, maybe even repulsive. Certain things might have stuck you as like, well, why are they doing that? Well, since we're not going to take a poll of all that you noted, um, let me highlight a few things that I struck me as odd in this passage for us to review. First one, it says, Now when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed. So oddity number one, um, why are singers appointed along with the guards of the gates? Can you picture that? The choir is out at the walls guarding the gates. Okay, verse 2 through 4. And I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem. He was more faithful and God-fearing than many. And I said to them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, and while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard post and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people in it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. So, oddity number two is why all this about the operation of the gates and at what time they should be opened or closed. Okay, verse 5a says, Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. So out of the number three, how is it that Nehemiah is always so confident about God and his will? He said, God put it into my heart. Oddity number four, what is the significance of a genealogy? Um, is it an attempt at racial cleansing or some form of racism? So those things stick out to me. Verse 5b through 6, <clears throat> And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at first, and I found written in it, these are the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. So oddity number five. So, so far we have five verses and five oddities. Um, 
So why use a 90-year-old genealogy? That's another thing. So then this genealogy begins of all those names begin flowing. But in verses in 43 and 45, it said this. It said the Levites, the sons of Jeshua, namely of Kidmiel, and the sons of Hadova, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Atur, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akbub, the sons of Hattiah, the sons of Shobai, 138. The temple servants and the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hasupa, the sons of Taboth. Now, oddity number six is why are all of these vocations being named along with their names? Like we got Levites, we've got singers, we've got gatekeepers and temple servants. So verses 50, 61 through 64. The following were those who came from Tel Malah and Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adon, and Emer, but they could not prove their father's houses nor their descent, whether they belonged to Israel, the sons of Delaiah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. Also of the priests, the sons of Hobiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who had taken a wife of the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite and was called by their name. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but it was not found there. And so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. So oddity number seven says, why are some excluded from Israel based on the fact that they cannot verify their genealogy? And why are some excluded as being priests? So finally, verses 67 through 69. Besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 245 singers, male and female, and their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. So oddity number eight. Why are the singers counted along with the servants and the horses and the mules and the camels and the donkeys? So worship team, what do you think about that? How do you like being counted along with the horses and the camels and the donkeys? Um, it's a little bit odd. So, and the truth is, I don't know why. And there won't be an answer to that question. But maybe that will become your favorite verse and you could make a little frame or something and put it up on your wall at your house. Uh, but... In any case, so these are things that seem odd to us as modern readers. The whole thing is odd, actually. Um, this whole idea of a genealogy and you know, all of this bother that they go through um, in these situations. So our postmodernist mentality causes us, first of all, to be suspicious of any truth claims. Why should what they say is true even be considered as true? So first of all, we come into this with this postmodern skepticism. Second of all, if you've noticed that there, in today's world, there's a lack of education in the social sciences regarding history. Um, there seems to be a lack of respect of previous generations and the lessons that they've learned. Um, so we see a lot of this on the TV. Um, you've noticed lately a lot of destruction of monuments. Now, um, many of them these monuments are destroyed because they are deemed to be racist, um, but there's actually more to it than that. And there's a growing Marxism in our culture. Okay, there's a growing Marxism in our culture that is uh, trying to purge us of our history so that it can be replaced with an alternative history. So all of these are factors in our own minds, in our modern minds, these, these things bear upon us. Um, as people, even when we look back on the, uh, the Bible 2,500 years ago, there's also the fact that the people in the Bible are primarily agrarian. Only 1.3% of the U.S. population today is agrarian, um, but it was 70% in 1840. Um, so that just makes relating to things in the Bible more difficult. If you have no idea 
how to care for animals or grow your own food or take it to market, all of those aspects of life become kind of foreign to us. We don't understand the people of the Bible. But there's also larger issues in minds of the Israelites at that time um, that we may not really be aware of. They were struggling as a nation to exist. Um, they had been carried away, as we know, by the Babylonians 140 years previously. God had judged them for their apostasy and their failure to follow God. And so he allowed these foreign nations to come in and carry them away. So the Babylonians came in 586 B.C. and carried away the nation of Israel and left just a very sparse number of people. Now, the book of Daniel, there's the prophecy that that disbursement will last for 70 years. Well, 70 years later, the Persians conquered the Babylonians, and in 538, the king Cyrus allowed this group of people that were in this genealogy to return and repopulate their land. So it said there was a number of 46,000 people came back. Now, think about it. Millions of people get carried away. 50,000 come back. Where's all the rest of them? They had uh, they'd become acculturated and lived in their local culture. They lost their national identity and also their perhaps even their desire to be part of God's plan of redemption that was the nation of Israel. And so only 50,000 of them came back. So they also had, uh, <clears throat> they were, a few chapters ago, we talked about some of the struggles that they had. They had economic struggles. Um, they were struggling financially. Their farms were failing. They were in drought. They were having to even sell themselves into servitude. So they had these things going on as well. Then they had the threats of their physical safety from these villains, Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem. So protection and physical safety were a big deal to them. Then theologically, they were a nation emerging from this time of national tragedy. They were carried away into exile, which was a judgment of God because of their turning away from God to their worthless idols. They wanted desperately to live in the right way. And so a way to ensure God's favor so that they would not suffer his rejection and judgment again. So all these things are in their mind. Now, the people that returned were just this remnant, as we talked about. 50,000 had returned. Um, so we see that, we've seen that Nehemiah was this man that God raised up. He raised up to lead, help lead this nation in, through difficult times. So Nehemiah was confident in his relationship with God. He said this in verse, in verse 5 of this passage. He said, then God put it into my heart. Um, he also said this on several other occasions in Nehemiah 2, 12. Then, it aro then I arose in the night, and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. And he also saw God's hand in everything that was accomplished through the eyes of faith. So in Nehemiah 14, or 5.14, it says this, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. And so Nehemiah was a man that saw God involved in everything that he was involved in and also heard God putting things on his heart. Okay, so would you like to be a person that can confidently say, God put this into my heart? We all want to be that. So what we need to do then is to spend time reading and studying God's word, and we need to look for what God is interested in. When you read the Bible, be looking, what, what is God's objective here? What is God interested in? What does God care about in this setting? And then you set your mind and your heart on those things, and it won't be long before you're the one saying, God has put something on my heart. Okay, whatever that might be, you'll be the one saying, God has put something on my heart that I need to pursue and to achieve for God's glory. Because you're spending time with the Lord, you're listening to what his heart is like, and then those things will become your heart. 
So it seems that as soon as the wall was completed and the gates were hung, that Nehemiah was busy to bring about a certain result. In verse 1, he appoints singers and Levites uh, to guard the city. Um, now, this would, what it would show is that the entire city of Jerusalem was different from any other city and was devoted to the worship of God. The Levites were one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they traditionally had the duty from Moses' time of guarding the tabernacle so that no one would approach the tabernacle inappropriately and be killed by God. So they guarded this tabernacle, and whenever they moved in the desert, they went out before it and alongside of it and behind it to protect the holiness of the tabernacle. So the Levites are a good, a good choice for guarding the gates. Okay, they're good guards. They know how to do this. But the singers? Okay, so I can imagine that as the gates opened and closed each day, the chorus may have sung a special song for that. And it would have been known and observed in all the territory around that Jerusalem is a holy city. So Nehemiah's mind was first on building the wall. Now it's turning on the worship, on building a people to worship a holy God. As we read further, we see that he prescribed certain hours for the gates to be opened, and they were not very many. With the gates opened, the, the, people's, the people that lived inside of the city, their attention was divided. Okay, The gates are open. They had to be guarded. All of this commerce is coming in and out of the city, and the people's attention that lived there was divided. And so Nehemiah said, only certain hours, when the sun is high, when the sun is hot, we're going to open the gates. And then a short time later, they're going to be closed again. So he did this for protecting the people within the city so they could stay on task. Now, on Thanksgiving Day, Janine and I were driving around, of course, because we'd forgot to do some of our shopping on Thanksgiving. And we found something different this year, that all the stores were closed. Walmart was closed. Publix was closed. You know, all this. Maybe you've noticed that yourself. Um, normally, those stores are open. But we also noted and remember at a time when every Sunday, everything was closed. Now, most of you haven't grown up with that. You're not that old. But when I grew up as a kid, nothing was open on a Sunday. And that has cost us greatly in our, in our country. Um, everyone had a Sabbath day. Everyone had a day of rest when basically nothing was open. Okay, you went home, you were with your family. You went to church, you were with your family. So how much the country has suffered by losing our faith in God? And one of the causes is the constant running around of our country without rest and without focus. It's a big loss for this to have happened. So I think this is also what Nehemiah had in mind too. He wanted the people to be able to focus on rebuilding the holy city. The city was empty and it was not populated, which was Nehemiah's next concern. Who would populate the city? As soon as he finished building the wall, his mind turned to the next thing, as it says in verse 5. Then God put into my mind, into my heart, to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. It says later in this book in chapter 11, and the rest of the people, now, okay, jumping to chapter 11, which we haven't gotten there yet, there's this verse. And the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in their other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Okay, so there's this effort. They're all living in their towns. Now they need that the wall is built to start repopulating Jerusalem and building a holy city. So Nehemiah, uh, as I read this book, he strikes me as an engineer. You know, that's the kind of personality that, that he has. He strikes me as an engineer. He knows what's important, but has a very functional approach to it. So worship of, of God was number one. He knew that. Worship of God is number one in this nation. In order to do that, the city of Jerusalem needs to be rebuilt. And with that done, next for worship, 
you need people. So it's all very practical for Nehemiah. Get the city built, get the people in here. The city needs to be repopulated. But in order for it to be repopulated correctly, it needs to be populated by the people of Jewish descent, thus the genealogy. Okay, so he dug up this genealogy from uh, Ezra, uh, who was the high priest, and, and Ezra had used it in before. So if you look at the book of Ezra, chapter 2, it's the same genealogy as used here in Nehemiah chapter 7. So Nehemiah had dug up this genealogy that Ezra had used, and it's about the rehabilitation of the land under Cyrus by this man named Zerubbabel, who led the people back, this, this 46,000 people. But that had happened 90 years earlier. So <clears throat> he didn't want to recreate a genealogy but he did need people to register according to it, as it says in verse 5. So Nehemiah's mind is clearly on building a holy people of God. And uh, hopefully now some of those oddities are beginning to make a little bit more sense now. But there's one thing that I am sure that seems very strange to our modern ears that does need to be explained further, and it's this. Why are some people that cannot prove their genealogy exclude from, excluded from belonging to Israel as it says in verse 61. So it seems harsh and cruel to exclude someone that wanted to be included. Um, they were faithful, hardworking people. How could they be excluded? Well, first of all, it needs to be explained that they were not being excluded from being in the nation. They had their homes. They were citizens. They were not being kicked out. But they were not descendants of Abraham, and so Nehemiah was aware that the covenant that they were under with God was for the descendants of Abraham. So I'll read this in Genesis 12. This is a very, very foundational verse, this Genesis 12 passage for the Jews and their understanding of their nation. It's almost like our, our constitution, okay? So Genesis 12, when God first began to speak to Abraham, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, or through your genealogy, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So we see here that God had a plan. He started with this one man, Abraham, and he said, you're nothing, you're just one man, but I'm going to take you and I'm going to build a great nation out of you. And through that nation, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth. So this is a very foundational concept for a Jewish person to understand that through the descendants of Abraham, the nations of the world would be blessed. And so that's where we are now. Nehemiah realizes that in terms of their nation, they were judged, they were taken into exile, and now they were rebuilding. And they're continuing, they're continuing in this blessing that God had given to Abraham. So God was not concerned about only one people group. He wanted to bless all the nations of the earth, but through the one holy nation descended from Abraham. So this is the covenant that Nehemiah was in, and though he was just an engineer, he was also concerned with theology too. So God was in the process of restoring a holy nation, and Nehemiah knew that it had better be done correctly despite the terrible cost and heartache of having even to exclude some people from living in Jerusalem. So the people that were not part of the in-group um, would not be eligible to live in the holy city. So even if we do understand it, it still seems harsh and cruel. Uh, but given that intermarriage with the surrounding nations had led to idolatry and falling away from God originally, you can now see why it's essential for them not to make the same mistakes over again. So, but today in the church, we have a similar issue. We have to be able to proclaim who's in and who's out from the family of God. 
Okay, the Bible makes it clear that genealogy is what determines your salvation. Now, all of you are looking at me, waiting for the next heresy that comes out of my mouth. Okay, but let me explain this. The Bible makes it clear that genealogy is what determines your salvation. Now, so you're all listening, but here's, here it is. John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. Jesus said, well, John said these words. He said, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world, speaking of Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made through Jesus, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, genealogy, being born of God, determines whether you will be in the heavenly city. And we also see that it's not by race or color or creed. We see God's plan has been fulfilled through Jesus Christ to bless all of the people of the earth through this nation of Israel. But that's a couple thousand, that's a, several hundred years later and a couple thousand years ago for us. It says it right here that many of the Jews, Jewish people by race did not receive him. But to those that did receive him by faith, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of the will of man, but of God. So when you personally put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you were born spiritually. That's what happens to us. We believe, we confess, we ask Jesus to come into our lives. And the Bible says that when there's genuine faith, there is a rebirth, a spiritual birth that takes place at that time. So just like any other creature that is born, um, you have a new set of capacities that come from your parents. Okay, same thing with being a Christian, being born of God, means that you have a new set of spiritual capacities that come from God. You are a new creature, the Bible says. Old things have passed away, all things have become new because you are a new creature. But your genealogy does determine if you will live in the heavenly city. And that's, of course, the genealogy of being born of God. We do no favors of telling people any differently. You must be part of God's genealogy to be in God's family. You must be born of him by putting your faith in him. So next, there is an odd situation of people being excluded from being priests because they could not prove their genealogy. So in our modern day, um, anyone could be a priest. Of course, if you're qualified and go to seminary and whatever that the church denomination demands of you. But in some parts of the church, it can also be men or women. So again, it sounds odd to us to exclude people in our modern thinking. But under the covenant, they were trying to under the covenant that they were trying to reestablish, the only ones that could be priests had to come from the tribe of Levi. It's one of the 12 sons of Jacob, and the Levites were, God says, I'm taking this tribe to be my own. They will take care of the tabernacle and the temple, and all of the priests come from that group of people, the Levites. So, they had to come, the priests had to come from the tribe of Levi that Moses and Aaron were from, and, but it was not all the Levites that could be priests. Only some of them could be priests. So it's clear that Nehemiah now is not just building a wall, but building a community, a spiritual community. And though that is the ultimate job of priests like Ezra, whom we will meet in the next chapter, in chapter 8, he was going to do all that he could do to lay the infrastructure of a holy city and a holy people. So God is creating a special people. God is creating a special people to be able to know and relate to him, of which we are a part. Uh, before this can be done, God had to overcome some significant obstacles. Okay, This is not an easy thing to do for God to be able to relate to you. Okay, God had to overcome some obstacles. So how can a perfect 
holy God relate to sinful, rebellious people? How can God be just or have justice and at the same time a justifier of sinful people like us? And that really is the core message of the Bible. The core message of the Bible is how can a holy God live and relate to unholy people? If you wanted to summarize the whole Bible, that's a good place to start. Because God has been working at that since the very beginning with Adam and Eve. We can trace it all through the Bible and culminating in Jesus Christ. So, next week we're going to start part two of this sermon right there. This is a to-be-continued sermon. Um, But we're going to pick up from this place and answer this question, how can a holy God live and relate to unholy people? So we need to first understand, um, we need to understand that first, before we can understand how to grow in our own holiness, um, we need to understand God's holiness. It says in Leviticus chapter 11, it says, For I am the Lord your God, Consecrate yourself, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So God wants to relate to us individually. And yet, as I just said, there are these obstacles for God to overcome. And then he did this through a scheme that he cooked up within the Trinity from the beginning of time the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit came up with this scheme that we call redemption and salvation in Christ. So we'll jump right into that next week. Even as odd as the Bible seems at times, um, we can be sure that there are reasonable answers. Um, That they're not just based on tradition or preference, but on who God is. So if we know who God is, what his heart is, the confusion and the doubts disappear. Okay, God is holy. What does that mean? How can God be holy and still relate to sinful men? What does he want from me? What does it mean for me to be holy? That's what we're going to explore next week. So please pray with me now. Father, we thank you for your word. Um, It has all sorts of details and things in it that uh, we would want to just glance past and not even think are significant. But Lord, if we take a little time and we slow down and we look at your word, we'll find all sorts of clues to what you're doing and what we need to believe and understand. And so, Father, thank you for your word that illuminates us and teaches us, even in these obscure passages like genealogies and things that are so distant from our modern culture. We can still learn, we can still see you and find you working to bring about redemption of people and nations and ourselves. And so, Lord, we we give you thanks this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand. Thank you for your death and resurrection. Thank you for the power of your love. And I am overwhelmed by your affection. The kindness and the greatness of your love. The kindness and the greatness of your love.
just a little note for next Sunday Um, the worship team the theme is holiness so I I don't usually give Carolyn any uh, prompt about what to sing but uh, next week she's not going to be here and uh, others will be filling in but uh, that's that's going to be our theme next week so all right now for the benediction which is God's blessing for you and uh, I'm going to read today from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So all this talk of Nehemiah building walls and building cities and a holy people, this is you. This is what God has built in his church in Jesus Christ. A holy people being built into a dwelling place for God in the Spirit, and that's you. So go in that knowledge and be blessed this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.